Well, if you have a high school senior in your family, you know that this is the time that there's either delight that's been received or anticipation that's there. When are they going to get that email or that letter from the college that they want to go to, the college of their choice? And to find out that the college of their choice has chosen them is a very special thing and a special honor. Same time, in a very different dimension, this is uh, kind of the run-up to the NFL playoff draft. And for football fans, all kinds of time will be wasted over the next month thinking and talking about the draft. Who's going to be chosen by what team and all of those things. And the players and the coaches are studying, looking for who has the strength, the speed, the skill, the anticipation to be chosen first. Tens of millions of dollars are involved in that at a, at a minimum. And it's a kind of choice that is life-changing. Choices. I, maybe you're like me and you can remember playground teams being formed up and uh, somebody choosing and you're waiting to be chosen or you're elected to be the chooser and as the line gets smaller and smaller of the group that no, I'm not going to be last chosen. And then if you are last saying, I'm going to prove something to them and getting out there and doing all you could. We all find places where being chosen, it may be for a job, it may be for a promotion, it may be for a group that we want to belong to, it may be for a social thing that I don't want to be left out, I want to be included. And nearly always we recognize that we're chosen for what we bring to the table, for some skill, some ability, some money, some influence, and we're chosen for those reasons. And even in the religious world, there, there's the conviction that if you do well, if you keep the rules, that God will smile upon you and choose you because you've earned it. And then we turn to the gospel. And we discover that there's no way we can be cho chosen on the basis of our goodness or merits. We have nothing to bring to the table. That we've broken God's law and we have no claim on him. And yet God chooses. It's interesting when we tell the story of our conversion or our salvation, we will begin in different places. Some of us will begin with hearing the gospel from our parents or others will talk about other situations and they'll talk about a friend or they'll talk about a book or they'll talk about an acquaintance who intercepted their life with the gospel in some particular way. And they'll tell that story and describe how it is that they come to be Christ followers. I love to hear those stories and nearly all of us do, even though I was one of those who could never tell what we were supposed to have, time, when, manner, how, place, where. I, I trusted Christ, but I couldn't name any of those things and felt badly about it for years until I decided if God didn't care that I couldn't remember, I didn't either. I knew I was trusting Christ. But when we come to the Bible, we discover it doesn't begin with my parents or that person who shared the gospel. Our intersection with the gospel began far earlier than that. And that's what Paul tells us about. And he wants a group of Christians to understand this is bigger than you've ever imagined and more amazing than you've ever stood, understood. So let's turn to Ephesians to hear what he's writing to a group of Christians in and around the city of Ephesus and the ancient area of what we know today as Turkey. He's in jail in Rome and he's writing to them. And as we come to verse 3, he begins with this long prayer. And we'll talk about that in just a minute, but we're going to look at verses 4 to 6, but let's read verses 3 to 6 to get the connection of thought. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as or because he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. Now, some of your Bibles will put a period there. That's what some translations do. Others will read, so that we might be holy and blameless before him in love and begin the sentence with verse seven. And if you look at modern translations, they're about split, one on one side and on the other. I am of the opinion that it's most likely to be with the preceding part. So it's holy and blameless before him in love. And I think the uh, odds that it's that way are about 51%. So it can go either way. It is true in both cases. When I speak, I'm tempted to add it to both sides of the equation and it fits there. But just to explain what's going on. So let's read on. Before him in love, he predestined us to adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, and again, more precisely, to the praise of the glory of his grace, with which he has blessed us, with which he has gifted us in the beloved. I mentioned last week that Ephesians has no shallow end. When you begin in Ephesians, you're pushed right into the deep end of the pool. And we have it in this passage this morning. Some of the ideas here are rich and deep and mysterious and cause us to feel like we're just trying to keep our heads above water as we think through these particular truths that we're going to be considering this morning. But let me remind you that verses 3 to 14 are being written by Paul from prison in Rome. And it's as he begins this letter... He nearly always begins with thanksgiving for the people that, to whom he's writing, but not this time. He, well, I, I view verses 3 to 14 as kind of when you shake a, a soda can and then you take the top off and it gushes out. Here's Paul, a prisoner, just gushing out this sense of praise and wonder to God that goes on for 202 words in the Greek language in one sentence, line after line, moving this way, that way, to say all that he wants to say, but he's organizing it because he wants to bless God for what he's done. And you'll notice to the praise of his glory, of his grace, verse six, to the praise of his glory, verse 12, to the praise of his glory, and up to in verses four to six, it's about what God the Father does. And then in verses seven to 12, it's about what the Son does. And then in verses 13 and 14, it's about what God the Holy Spirit does. So now as we come to verse four, having said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, everything initiates with him, everything comes from him. He wants to emphasize three great parts of the Father's work. There's more than this, but there's never less than this. And he wants us to understand about the Father's part in our salvation. And it begins before the beginning, which may seem a curious way to say it. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus because even as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we might be holy and blameless before him in love. The first truth about God's work in our salvation is he chose us. He initiated by choosing us. And I want you to notice three things about that choice. First of all, that choice was sovereign. It was God's sovereign choice. When you come to the Bible, you quickly discover God is a God who chooses. He chose Abraham. He chose 
Isaac and not Ishmael. He chose Jacob the younger rather than Esau the older. He chose Moses the younger son rather than Aaron the older son, which was contrary to the way the culture would choose. He chose David, the very youngest of all kinds of sons, over Saul, the people's popular choice. Chose 12 disciples and he said to them, you haven't chosen me, I've chosen you. He chose Saul of Tarsus on a campaign to kill and jail as many Christians as he could. And sovereignly he stepped into Saul's life going in the opposite direction and brought him to himself. And he does it, notice in the text, I want you to notice this expression that occurs over and over, the end of verse 5. He did it according to the purpose, that is the good pleasure, the delight of his will. Verse 9, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose. Verse 11, according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Why did God choose? Because he's God. Why did he choose us? Not because of our merit, but he chose us in Christ. When did he choose? God's choice is sovereign. It is God's act. And his choice is not only sovereign, it is before time. Now that's where it gets really challenging for us. He chose us in Christ before the creation of the universe. Before anything existed. Now, whether you date this old earth and you're into billions of years or you date it more recently, that's a long time ago. Before anything was us and the us, he chose us. Who are they? They are believers in Jesus. That's what verse 1 says. If you're a believer in Christ, your salvation began before the world did. You were in God's mind. You were on God's heart. You were known by name. I don't know about you, but that's incomprehensible to me. But it is astonishing to me that God is a God of such sovereign knowledge that he chose, and it couldn't have been because of something I had done. I hadn't done anything yet. I didn't exist yet. And what I had done, well, we'll see it in just a moment, didn't put me in a position. As a matter of fact, the whole purpose that he's going to save me is I'll become something I can't become on my own. So what he wants us to understand is the sheer wonder of God's choice. Now, he doesn't try to answer all the questions like that. He doesn't try to unravel all of the things that immediately come to our mind related to why me and all of those other things. He wants us to understand what is clearly taught, and the Bible clearly teaches that we are in the family of God because of God's sovereign choice. There is a responsibility that we have. There is a place that play, but it's God the sovereign who is ultimately in charge, and he chose us purposefully, sovereignly, purposefully, sovereignly, eternally, and purposefully. He chose us so that we might be holy and blameless before him in his presence. That one day we would stand in the presence of God and reflect his character and reflect his being. Paul puts it like this in Romans chapter 8, verse 29. He predestined us 
to be conformed to his son, that he might be first among many brothers. Now, there is a sense in which we are already holy. That is our position before God, because if we've trusted Christ, we are connected to him. So we began this book by it being addressed to the saints, to the holy ones. But even though that is our position, because we're forgiven and freely accepted in Christ, it's not our condition. Right now, we are sinful people. And God is at present working in our lives, sanctifying us, changing us, moving in the direction of holiness. But one day when we are in his presence and we receive the resurrection body and we are before the Lord, we will stand in his presence, fully acceptable before him. But that's the first thing. He then comes back and God's initiative was not only to chose us, but to predestine us, predestinate us, to ordain a future for us. So notice verse 5. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, the word predestine, and it's a word that conjures up all kinds of images, but it means simply to choose for a reason, to choose for a destiny. And it's a word that, simply put, means God works according to plan. God has a plan, and he is fulfilling a plan. And we know that's how it works. If you build a house, you don't just gather together a bunch of equipment, and then let's see how this turns out and start building. You need a plan. You need a knowledge ahead of time. And God is working according to plan. He has a destination that he intends for us in view. I like the way one commentator puts it, that God is not like a skilled chess master whose next move depends on the move of the player before. God controls all the pieces, has all of the elements, and he is working according to plan. And the plan is adoption. Now, we need to do a little bit of cultural shift here. Because when we think of adoption, Almost inevitably, we think of children in Ukraine who are now going to be without parents and bringing them in and caring for them and looking after them. And we've seen the pictures of those little babies, some of them who are arranged for on a surrogate basis and how's that going to work out. And adoption in our minds is related especially to children. The Jews didn't have a program of adoption. So this is not a Jewish word. But the Romans did. But the Roman adoption was about adults, especially about men. That's why it talked about placing as sons, because that was the concern. And adoption was when a wealthy or significant or prestigious person wanted to carry on his line or to carry on some effort, but he didn't have a son or he didn't have a competent son And so he would adopt an adult son. It could be a younger one or an older one. It was a weird kind of uh, program they went through. And uh, there was a series, he would sell him to his, his son, to this man as a slave, and then he would return him. And then, anyway, the ritual was nonsensical. But the reality is that when that person finally had the position of a son, He had all of the rights, all of the privileges of the father. All his debts were canceled. All his past was gone. Everything was related to the son. That's how Octavius became the emperor of Rome. Because Julius Caesar adopted him. And he became Caesar Augustus. The one whose name starts the Christmas story. Or Claudius adopted 
uh, Nero, which was not a very good choice. But that was what was going on. Now, what he's saying is, listen, God didn't predestine us to be servants. God predestined us to be sons and daughters, to have the full privilege of the family, to be included in all of the blessings that God has given and all of the blessings that he wants to receive. Now, just to bring this home a little bit more, Jim Packer in his uh, marvelous book, Knowing God, reminds us of the fact that the old theologians used to talk about justification by faith. The great truth of the gospel. We're saved by faith alone. They used to talk about that as the basic principle of the gospel. Justification means I've stood before God, the, my judge. And as God, my judge, sees what Christ has done on behalf, he pronounces me not just forgiven, but righteous because the riches of Christ are given to me and I'm righteous before the judge. But then he goes on to say, if justification is the basic principle of the gospel, adoption is the supreme blessing of the gospel. Because in justification, I stand before God, my judge. In adoption, I stand before God as my father. Embraced with all that that means. He writes this. Adoption is the highest privilege the gospel offers. Even greater than justification. Adoption is a family idea. God takes us into his family and fellowship and establishes as his children and heirs. Closeness, affection, generosity are at the heart of that relationship. To be right with God the judge is a great thing, but to be loved and cared for by God the Father is far greater. Do you hear John? Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called sons of God. And we are. And that delight in that. When the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law, that he might redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And God has sent forth his spirit into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. We've not received a spirit of bondage again to fear but a spirit of adoption which cries, Abba, Father. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we might reign together with him. God chose you for his family. To be involved in all that he knows. And notice the way it's put at the end according to the, the way I would like to translate this is to the good pleasure, the delight of his will. God delights in his children. That God who purposed and set his heart on you has brought you into his family. Election, choice, adoption, Sonship, daughtership. And then verse 6. That we might be to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he has gifted us, engraced us with. Because it's a play on the word grace. In the beloved. I love the translation of this. It's a, more a paraphrase than a translation that says, we are accepted in the beloved. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And we're accepted because of the riches of his grace. Notice how he delights in that expression in this context 
context, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he has gifted us, graced us with in the beloved. And then notice at the end of verse five, according to the riches of his grace, which he's lavished upon us. And what Paul wants us to know that we've been brought into this position before God to be not only accepted as sons, but to have grace richly supplied. We are engraced that we have the riches of God's grace as we live our lives daily until it all will reach its consummation. And all of this is to the praise of the glory of his grace. God wants to display his grace. I love it when uh, it's just snowed and it'll probably happen tomorrow. And you go out and you look at the mountains that are here. And all of a sudden they're topped with snow. And you see the beauty of them. Or you travel north up the coast and you go by these snow-capped mountains from Mount Shasta onto Mount Hood and up into the others, finally to Mount Rainier and Mount Baker to the border and on into the really good mountains up in Canada. <laughs> and grace is the peak of the glory of God. He spoke a word and the creation came into being. He sent his son and grace became lavish toward us. It cost God his son to display the glory of his grace and all that we have in Christ. And we're accepted in union with him. And that's Paul's constant concern. This is all in Christ. It's all because of who he is. It's all because of what he's done. And then in verse 7, he'll point us more directly to him. If you've trusted Christ, oh, I know in one sense you've chosen him. You put your faith and trust in him. But you would not have done that if he had not chosen you and worked in your heart by his spirit to bring you to trust him. And that gives us a security. But what God is doing with us isn't done randomly. He plotted, if I can put it that way, our salvation before he even brought the universe into existence. And God's work of election has brought us into a position of adoption. And adoption, as we've already said, means we not only have God's gifts, we have God himself who loves us and has given us out of his richness, his own son. And then all of that means he has graciously showered upon us the riches of his grace so that others may look on us and see his glory. The heavens display the glory of God. God's people are called to display the glory of grace. And that's a great responsibility. People should see the work of God in my life and bow in praise of him. And who's capable of that. None of us in our own. That's why we come back to the table and we remind ourselves over and over and over of what it costs God, what it costs Christ to bring us into his family as sons and daughters. We come to the table every Sunday morning here at Redeemer Fellowship just to remember what the Lord Jesus asked us to do, to take bread, to take the cup, 
in remembrance of him and in remembering to give thanks in remembering to renew our commitment in remembering to repent. If you've trusted Christ, he invites you to take these symbols. If you've not trusted Christ and you hear him at work in your heart, open your heart in faith and trust. We're going to sing about that paradox, the wonderful cross, as we take the symbols together. Let's pray. Father, your plan of salvation is bigger than anything we can imagine. We, we think so commonly of it. We're used to it. And we lose our awe before it. God's, your plan, transcended time and space and extends into all eternity future to bring us before you as sons and daughters, holy and blameless, sinful, weak, wandering people, holy and blameless in love before you. Humble our hearts as we take these symbols and remind us of the Beloved and his gift on our behalf. In his name we pray. Amen.